that note, I wanted to point out that the spectroscopy project is now up. It is not due until November 10th, so over a month away, but it is there. Um, a few things kind of on this. So uh, I did a mistake, um, which I don't think I can ever do a unit conversion thing without making a mistake. I think that's what I have learned in grad school. So my unit conversion for y'all was wrong. Um, so I've done a little bit of a note about how to fix that and also how to calculate errors for your um, U fluxes, um, for your U fluxes. Um, but that I hope won't be too challenging and it will, this will walk you through it. Please let me know if you have problems. This is why you were getting really, 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 really large numbers and this will get you to more reasonable numbers, but that was on me um, and that means I am taking very minimal points off if you did a unit mis a conversion mistake because I do them too. So um, most people didn't. I saw a question. Yeah, I looked specifically at the SS S, sorry, SDSS website and like what, cause I was like, what is a nano Maggie? So I kind of just like looked it up anyway. Um, and it's, I think you had the correct unit conversion, like at least how SDSS described it. So I had the right zero point, but I told you how to convert wrong. So it, SDSS's website is a bit confusing and what they say is slightly wrong. Nanomaggies are kind of a form of magnitude. So there's a logarithm involved. Um, so that's the conversion to a zero point in magnitude somehow, but then you also have to get to Jansky's. So it's a bit more complicated. Um, I think I did exactly that. So yeah. S SDSS nano maggies are their own beast and they're kind of gross and I thought I had it and I did not um <laughs> but like I said that's there so I want you guys to get fluxes that are a little bit more reasonable um this file will kind of explain how to do that um and it won't be hopefully too difficult it'll just be a little bit of math but if you are having issues let me know um the main thing is the spectroscopy project which has two point two parts. Sorry, if I can talk. Um, the first one is doing some SED fitting, which I'm going to walk through today, how to do that. Um, hopefully it'll all work. I'm expecting things to break. So your kind of assignment for today is to tell me what broke. Um, I That's my <laughs> kind of goal. So then I can try to see where I might need to go back and help you but I, I am expecting things to break and I will walk through that today. So you guys will see me um, downloading and running Seagal and I'm hoping that you will have the bandwidth and computer power to do it with me. Um, but if not, this will be posted as a YouTube video later so you can follow along afterwards. Um, just so you know, this does also walk through sort of how to run Seagal um, and everything. Um, so the idea is you'll turn in an SED fit as long as, well, with a little bit of information about what you can get from that. And then we'll also do some line fitting. So that'll be next week, we'll do line fitting. So you'll be able to do both parts of this after next week. Hopefully the Seagal stuff will go okay this week. Um, if we run into too many problems, I might edit this because I was scrambling a bit this morning and having more problems with Seagal than I thought, but I think it'll run for me. I'm hoping it, isn't too painful because I would like for it to run for you, but um, if it's not, let me know. Don't spend 10 hours trying to get it to work or even two hours because <laughs> um, that that's not the goal of this. So that is up just so you know. Um, and like I said, we'll kind of walk through how to run Seagal today. Um, which would, is going to make this slightly choppy, slightly more choppy than normal, because some of those steps take some time. Um, so I'm going to kind of jump between doing coding and talking about SEDs. So today's lecture is going to be a little different, but I'm hoping that'll set us up well for this homework assignment. Any questions about any of that before I dive in? Okay. Sorry, 
So today we're going to talk a little bit more about what we can learn from SED. So last week or last class, we talked about how we build SED models. And this will be after you have fit your SED model, what can you learn from it? So this is kind of building off of the um, what you guys did in class um, where you answered some questions about models. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about how we get those values and um, just kind of what we can do once we have our SED fit. Um, but first, just as a bit of a review, um, last week we talked about how SED models use both dust models and simple stellar populations to figure to estimate the flux we would expect to see from a galaxy. Um, in the chat or out loud, could you give me one of the three ingredients for a simple stellar population? So there were three parts, three things that went into that. Um, in the chat, if you type, if, you, if we can get all three between all of us. Cool. I got one. One was isochrones. That's right. So isochrones are those um, <clears throat> numbers of stars at different fluxes at different age populations of those stars. We have our isochrone that tells us how many stars we expect to see at different ages. What else went in? Initial mass function. Yeah. So how many stars we would expect to see right after they formed. There was one more thing. And the stellar spectra sample library. Thank you, Justin. So that is all of it. So we got our stellar spectra sample library, which tells us how the um, specter of this, each individual star, and then our initial, initial mass function and our isochrone, which will tell us how many of each type of star we expect to see. And this is another kind of library of simple stellar populations that I'm showing here. Again, wavelength versus, this is essentially a, mostly a flux um, of <laughs> luminosity, um, slightly weird units there, but mostly a luminosity, so brightness versus wavelength. And what we can see is for young populations, so these colors are kind of terrible, they look the same, but for the youngest populations, um, there's a lot of UV light and less, um, well, less-ish red light. And then as they age, that UV kind of drops off and we see a change in kind of this big break here, the Lyman break, and eventually there's almost no UV light. We're dominated by kind of the optical and red light. Um, when we get to populations of stars that are um, billions of years old, when our O and B stars have all died. Okay, deep breath. We're gonna try to get Seagal going. So um, I'm gonna start by what we're gonna need to do. So there's a few ways to do this. So I'm gonna try to explain. I'm going to use Jupyter Notebooks um, and run a terminal from Jupyter Notebooks. If you are on a Mac, you can do this from just a terminal on your computer. If you are on a Windows machine and you have your own version of terminal where you can run code, you can do that there. Um, I think Jupyter Notebooks has a nice version of terminals that I'm just going to work with and show you because I think it's pretty visual, um, but open to how you want to do this. Um, so I'm in a Jupyter Notebook. Instead of opening a new notebook, I'm going to open a terminal because we're going to need to work in terminal to um, run Seagal. So with terminals, if you haven't used these before, um, I give you in the spectroscopy project, I tell you a few little um, useful code, but just as to kind of show some things, if you type ls in a terminal, that gives you a list of everything that is in the folder you are currently in. Um, you can, so just like if you open Finder, if you open your files, you'll see different folders. Um, this shows you which folders are here or which files are there. Um, if I wanted to change, if I wanted to move from my base directory to my desktop directory, I would do CD desktop and I can do DAS if I type tab, um, it'll let me, uh, it'll complete the command for me. So I am now in my desktop directory. Um, if I list what's there, you'll see I've got some folders and I also have a folder called Seagal, um, which with a bunch of junk, which I have, um, which I downloaded and then I also uncompressed. So I'm going to move into that Seagal directory using CD Seagal and then tab 
will complete it so I don't have to type all that garbage out. So now I am in the Seagal directory. We should see there's some nice things that come with this. I've run a few things, so I should have more stuff than you do. So all those out files, it makes sense that you should not see those. So um, once you are there, I'll note also, sorry, I should have said this first, um, in your assignments, jumping around, um, there's a, in the SED part two assignment, there's a few files that you can look at that um, we won't, don't need quite yet, but there's also a PDF, um, which has all the code we're going to run. So if you don't wanna type it out, you can copy and paste. There's a few things that are wrong that I'm gonna fix after this class, um, but uh, I just didn't get around to it quite yet. So um, the first thing we need to do in our terminal is change from where we are, a sh this, this is a T shell, we're gonna change to a bash shell. So the, to do that, all we have to do is type bash. So that's the first thing we do. Now we are in a bash shell in our Seagal um, thing. Don't worry too much about it. It just runs code slightly differently. Then we need to do this first code here, this conda update conda, which just tells Anaconda to update itself. And this is gonna be the first thing that takes a bit of time. So I wanted to get this started. Um, I think mine, so you should see something after a few seconds where it asks if you wanna proceed, um, should be good to type yes. And now it did it fast for me, it might take longer for you because I updated Anaconda this morning. So um, I'm going to switch back to my lecture. So that's the first thing, all we've done is update Anaconda um, in a terminal getting ready to run Seagal. So that's the first thing you have to do. As that is running <laughs> for all of you, um, I guess any, any big questions so far? Okay, while it's running, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about SED fitting. So again, I'm gonna try to, it's gonna be slightly disjointed and sorry. Um, hopefully it won't be too bad. This will be the only day I do something like this. Um, so the, what we're talking about today is what we can learn from SED fits. Um, specifically, we're gonna be working with SIGAL, which is the code investigating GAL ICSI emission. So C-I-G-A-L-E. Um, if you haven't realized that astronomers are the worst at naming things, this is an example of how astronomers are the worst at naming things. Um, I also worked with a program once called Gandalf, which is gas and absorption line fitting. So um, the hoops they had to jump through to get Gandalf to actually work as an acronym, it's a little, I have my opinions. Um, Anyways, um, so, but we're gonna be working with Seagal. Seagal is a SED fitter that uses energy balancing to try to estimate the amount of um, gas in a galaxy. So it says, if there's this much infrared light absorbed by dust, there must be, or emitted by dust, there must be this much infra UV light absorbed by dust so I can fit my stel simple, stellar, simple stellar population and get an idea of how many stars and how much dust is in the galaxy. Um, so as an example, once we've gotten our fit, one of the things we can learn about our galaxy is the property of the stars in that galaxy. So there's a few different things SEDs can estimate. Um, the first one is the stellar mass to light ratio. So the amount of stellar mass divided by the amount of star light from a galaxy. A big note, this is not the galaxy's mass to light ratio there's no dark matter involved here. So galaxies masses are gonna be much heavier if we were including dark matter, but SEDs can't fit dark matter at all because they're not looking at, dark matter doesn't radiate light, so they don't, it doesn't contribute to the spectra. Um, you measure dark matter by looking at rotation mostly, and SED is not, or SED fitters are not actually seeing any of that rotation. They're just seeing the kind of overall luminosity. 
But what we could do is we could take our stellar mass to light ratio, so the stellar mass, the mass of stars divided by the stellar luminosity, and you could compare that to the galaxy's measured mass to light ratio and learn about the fraction of um, mass of the galaxy that is dark matter. So we can learn about, we can, we can use the stellar mass to light ratio to get it more information about dark matter, but we're not going to be able to um, actually get the total mass to light ratio from an SED fit, just the stellar mass to light ratio. Um, on that note, we can also estimate stellar masses, um, which might not be surprising after I said that. And I know that was one of the things I asked you to kind of think about how SED fits could do last class. Um, and the idea is if we um, integrate the time evolved mass function, so we take our initial mass function and our isochrone, we can combine those to get an idea of how many stars we expect to see in every mass based on what um, simple stellar population fit best for our galaxy. And we can get um, a stellar mass for that galaxy. And this will give us the stellar mass at about a 0.3 dex certainty. And so dex in astronomy is a, order of magnitude. So you'll see dex thrown around when they talk about errors a lot. So um, 0.3 dex means 0.3 times 10. So we're within an order of magnitude of the right stellar mass. Um, it's not great, but we don't have a whole lot um, of better methods for measuring stellar mass. So um, it's a good method of estimating. Um, we can't take a galaxy and put it on a scale. Um, and we can't specifically take all the stars in a galaxy and put them on a scale either. So we have to do our best um, and SED fits are one way to try to get at a stellar mass without actually being able to um, weigh all the stars in a galaxy. Um, we can also estimate the metallicity as well as the stellar age. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about those on separate slides. So, um, Metallicity is the ratio of heavier elements or metals, so everything that's not hydrogen and helium to hydrogen, so heavy metals over hydrogen. In galaxies, this is typically measured as 12 plus log OH, but there are a few other ways you might see it. So um, I'm going to try to do some typing. We're going to see how this goes. Um, Cool. You can see that. Hopefully, can you see what I'm typing? Uh, um, so 12 plus log O H is going to be um, equal to 12 plus the base 10 log of the ratio of a couple of oxygen lines. Sorry, let me make sure I get the right ones. Um, so that's three, that's supposed to be angstroms, but I can't type that. Um, easily. Divided by the H beta line. So we're estimating the amount of oxygen compared to the amount of hydrogen by looking at the strength of a few oxygen lines divided by the strength of the H beta line. The reason why we are using these lines specifically is that they all have similar-ish wavelengths. So they're all kind of in that bluish green area-ish, <laughs> which means that um, the dust extinction the oxygen lines have and the dust extinction the H beta line has will be fairly similar. So we can get an idea of how much oxygen there is compared to the amount of hydrogen without having to worry about dust corrections. The reason we add 12 is to make it positive. Um, there's gonna be a lot more hydrogen than there is gonna be heavier elements. So instead of working with negative values, we often add 12 to get positive values, which gives us typical values of this 12 lot plus log OH um, between eight and nine. So um, for a galaxy, a typical metallicity, um, if we're using this notation, is going to be between eight and nine, um, which means the, um, oxygen to hydrogen, number of oxygen to hydrogen is going to be more around um, negative four, which means there's, you know, 10,000 oxygen particles for every hydrogen particle. 10,000 hydrogen particles for every oxygen particle, sorry. So um, negative four, which means 
log negative four is 0 0.0001. So um, 10,000 times more hydrogen than oxygen. Sorry, uh, <laughs> metallicities always get me. Um, there's a few other ways we can measure metallicity. Um, these are primarily used for stars, but I wanted to briefly touch on them here. So you can look at the log Fe over H or the log iron over hydrogen, which is going to be the number of hydrogen atoms divided by the number of iron atoms divided by the number of hydrogen atoms, excuse me, again, base 10 log. Um, or you might sometimes see this square brackets Fe over H, which this, um, let me make a new text box so I can write this out. Um, this is going to be equal to um, the log Fe over H of your star divided by the solar metallicity. So this is a way that we can get a metallicity value compared to the sun. So um, we can also, because these are logs, we can think of this as a difference of um, your star minus So that means if you have a Fe over H in square brackets of zero, you are at solar metallicity. Um, if you have a log Fe over H of one, you have 10 times more metals than the sun. Um, and if you have a negative Fe over H in square brackets, you have fewer metals than the sun. Um, the sun has a metallicity in Fe over H of about negative 4.33. So there are about 20,000 hydrogen atoms for every one iron atom. Uh, this is, I had another question I wanted to ask here. It might be kind of said on the slide, but um, what properties does metallicity trace? Why might we be interested in looking at metallicity? Yeah, Ethan. Yeah. So um, usually when we're talking about metallicity, we're talking about like, like the population of stars. So like population one, two, or three, um, which yeah, it does get at the age of them oftentimes. Yeah, so Maxwell and Sabrina also both said age in the chat. Yeah. Um, population, we can look for the oldest stars by looking for stars with um, very little metals. Um, why would older stars have no metals? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, because metals didn't exist when they formed yet, because there hadn't been stars to make the metals before. Exactly. So we need supernova to get heavy elements. If there have been no supernova, there are no heavy elements. Um, there's a little bit of lithium gets made in the Big Bang, but not much of anything else. I think lithium and beryllium, maybe. Um, anyways, also it was super cool. Sorry, this is a side note. But when LIGO like, said all of the gold and silver in the universe is coming from merging neutron stars. So obviously not a metallicity thing, but um, sort of related where if we want to get gold and silver, you need the universe to existed long enough that two massive-ish stars died, turned into neutron stars, and then spiraled into each other, which is like, takes a certain amount of time. Um, I am not a stellar astronomer. Um, I was not prepared to go um, <laughs> on that tangent today. Uh, <laughs> cool. Sabrina's is also iodine. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Although I try, there's a, another tangent. Um, when I backpack with my advisor and my mom now, um, we use his lightsaber, which is um, a UV filter. So you stick a UV light in your water and um, it purifies it, which is awesome. Okay, anyways, so uh, 
back to our SED fitting. Sorry, you should not ask me questions about hiking and I will, I will go off forever. Um, if we see lower metallicities, we know we're looking at older populations, often globular clusters. Um, if we see higher metallicities, we're looking at younger populations, often in disk stars. Um, and then you can look at kind of also how um, metallicity, this is just a graph from a paper showing how you might compare metallicity to other traits um, and see how different populations have different metallicities. So different galaxies have different metallicities. And that can correspond to other things that are going on. And we can use that to try to get an idea of how galaxies evolve. Um, it should, I should note though, any um, metallicity that you get from an SED model is pretty suspect because most of the ways we metal, measure metallicity is by looking at emission lines and SED fitters can't measure me, um, emission lines. Oops, sorry. Okay. What they can do though, is they can look a little bit at the reddening caused by metallicity. So um, in, your, in the simple stellar populations, metallicity was one of the properties. Um, and that's because more metals will make um, your stars slightly redder um, since they increase the opacity of the star. So we see less um, far into them. So um, they do, metallicity does slightly change your simple stellar population. But when you're looking at a galaxy, you've got a lot of different stars at different metallicities. Um, so it gets a little hard to pull out a metallicity from a simple stellar population. Just to kind of highlight what's going on here, since it's a bit hard to see, um, here we've got lower metallicity, a metallicity of negative 3.5 compared to the sun. So this is like that Fe over H because we're in square brackets, so we're comparing to the sun. Um, has more UV light. Um, and as we get to higher metallicities closer to solar, we're seeing more absorption um, in the UV from those metals and less of that UV light. So that's how metallicity could affect your simple stellar population. So you can get an estimate from an SED fit, but it's going to be a very iffy estimate. So I'm gonna pause again um, and jump back to here. So that's how we get metallicity and what metallicity is. Now, next step on this code, sorry, I'm trying to see things without running through, is to create a Python um, environment on your Anaconda thing. This is where there is an error in my text. This should be 3.8. So um, this might also not let me do this. So I think I might have to rename this guy. Sorry. Um, nope, I didn't copy it. Okay. Uh, so you should be able to run a code that looks something like this. I'm trying to, I don't think I have anything called that yet. So um, the only thing is we want to change that 3.7 to 3.8. This just creates an anaconda environment that we are going to work with in using Python 3.8. So this is also going to take a second. So while that is happening, I'm going to jump back to the lecture. <laughs> Deep breath, keep talking about SEDs. Another I thing we can get from SEDs is a star formation history. This is going to be another kind of iffy, hand wavy thing we get from an SED, but we can get at least, this is one way we can get a kind of idea of how stars have been forming over time in a galaxy, which is cool. And there's not really a lot of other ways to potentially do this. So this is the best we can do for the star formation history, how the galaxy has been forming stars over time. Um, and we do this by looking at the different populations of stars in the galaxy. So based on um, what um, simple stellar populations um, fit in your SED model, it can get an idea of how stars have formed over time. Um, so if we see a lot of 
if we're fitting a simple stellar population that seems really heavily weighted with O and B stars, then we know that there must be star formation happening recently. If we're not seeing any of that, we know it's been a while since there's been a new star formation. If we're not seeing though that UV light from O and B stars, if our simple stellar population is made up of isochrones that are older, then we know that um, we haven't had star formation for a while and we can kind of get an idea of how star formation has occurred over time. And what we see is that in a lot of elliptical galaxies, when we do, um, oops, sorry, um, when we do this kind of star formation history measurement, that really far in the past, there was a huge burst in star formation. And since then, there's been almost nothing. Whereas with spirals, there's never like huge bursts of star formation, but they've been fairly constantly forming stars at a lower rate throughout time. And what we think this means is it tells us a little bit about how ellipticals form um, and spirals form. When we talk about collisions, we'll talk about this more. But the idea is some early time in the past, ellipticals had a ton of material falling in on them, potentially smaller galaxies colliding um, and inciting bursts of star formation, fueling bursts of star formation really early on in the history of the universe. In those bursts of star formation, they use up all of their gas, they form all of their gas into stars, and then they run out of gas to form into stars and we're left with just an old population of stars. Whereas spirals seem to have a kind of more slow and steady infall of smaller galaxies um, that provide the gas to fuel star formation over time. This is just another kind of image from a paper that is looking at how these, um, another way you might see this kind of star formation history. So for a quiescent galaxy, for a elliptical galaxy and not actively star forming galaxy, um, you'll see something that will be these mass fractions um, versus look back time. So this is the fraction of the stellar mass that formed as a function of time. Um, so on this quiescent galaxy, pretty much 100% of its stars, nearly 100% of its stars formed 14 billion years ago-ish. So right near the beginning of the universe. And then since then, there hasn't been much star formation based on kind of SED fits looking at the spectrum of this galaxy. Whereas with um, a star forming galaxy, you'll see something more sure this one had a burst really early on in the history of the universe that formed most of its stars, maybe 80% of its stars. But since then, more recently, we've seen kind of an increase in star formation rate again, where about um, a little over 10% of the mass of stars in this galaxy formed in the last 0.03 billion years. Um, a few notes on these graphs. Um, the time scale is not linear because redshift is not linear. So um, this is probably a linear in redshift graph, um, which they aren't showing. Um, and redshifts, um, as you step, as you get further back, uh, one one step in redshift is not the same amount of time. So, kind of rules of thumb, um, a redshift of one is about half the age of the universe, so about 7 billion light years away. A redshift of two is about 10 billion light years away, um, so about 10 billion years ago. So um, zero, z of zero to z of one is 7 billion years, z of one to z of two is only 3 billion years. So this is kind of a weird how the universe expands issue. Um, so because of that, a lot of times when we plot look back time, it is not linear, it's linear in redshift. Um, but we can get these kind of ideas, these star formation histories um, based on the spectrum and the SED fits that we can do to galaxies. Okay. Any questions on any of that so far? Okay, I'm gonna jump back over to here. Oh, I needed to hit yes and I didn't. Um, hopefully this won't be terrible. Should have waited. Should know these things. Um, I don't think it'll be terrible. Um, well, that's happening. I'll go back over here. So we're almost, to the actual installing of Seagal. This is just creating an environment where Seagal will run. 
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and copy this so I'm ready to run it. What's happening? <laughs> I think there's like one more long step and the rest of it's faster, I promise. Um, okay, we'll let that run and I'll just make sure I take another break in a couple of slides. Maybe just after this one. Okay, um, so <laughs> the next thing we can learn about galaxies. So that was a lot about what we can learn about the stars in a galaxy. Um, SED fitting will also tell us a lot about the dust in a galaxy. Um, so, which are kind of the two main things that are emitting light, um, since we said we can't really learn a ton about the gas. Um, so by looking at both the attenuation and emission from the dust, there are things we can learn about that. Um, I really quickly just wanted to throw in um, a specific dust SED fit sort of thing. So this is just fitting light from five microns to 40 ish microns. So this is only looking at PAHs. This is a specific program called PAH fit, which does fitting um, for the spectra of PAHs and tells you how much um, how many different PAH emission features it sees what the strength of those features are. Um, so you can do, we're doing SED fitting of UV through IR light, but you can also do SED fitting of just a very specific chunk of the um, galaxy's light as well, if you're really interested in just the PAHs or just the UV light, whatever you're interested in, you can kind of um, find SED fitters that will work for you. Um, but by looking at the whole galaxy or the light from the UV to the IR, um, you can get kind of bigger properties about, or properties about a wider range of things. They may not be as accurate as doing this kind of individual stuff, but um, you get more information sort of. Okay, that happened. So we can do the next two steps. Don't use the conda activate. You should use instead source activate pi. So I think I gave you pi three, but whichever you called it, that doesn't matter. It's just a name. Um, and this is just saying we want to go into this environment. So that doesn't take super long. The last thing we have to do is just load all the programs that we want to use. So you should just be able to copy and paste this. Um, and this should be the last potentially long step. And it might ask again for a yes. So I'm going to give it two seconds because I'm pretty sure it's going to ask me. Yep, so when you see this, you should be good to just hit yes. And then it'll load. Oh, cool. That was fast. I forgot. I need to remember which steps are fast and which are slow. So now everything is ready for us to run Seagal um, once I finish discussing SED fits. So that's how we set up our terminal to run Seagal. Um, we still have to do a little bit more to download it, but I'll do that at the end. I don't think any of those steps take too incredibly long. Okay. So with our dust, um, the few things that we can get, um, the what we can get out of it, we can get both um, information about the amount of attenuation caused by dust. And we find that by looking at something called the IRX beta relationship, as well as the um, energy balance. So that tells us both the amount of attenuation caused by, if we can get the attenuation by dust, we can find out the estimations of the unattenuated starlight which is cool if you want to know how much energy is in your galaxy before it goes through all the dust. Um, so if you want to figure out what's happening in the UV, how many um, young stars there are, it's nice to be able to try to correct for the dust um, using things like SED fits. So IRX beta um, is, this is kind of a plot showing IRX versus beta. 
And what IRX and beta R IRX is the infrared excess. So it's the ratio of IR luminosity to UV luminosity. So LIR divided by LUV um, is going to be our IRX. Um, galaxies with lots of dust will have a high IRX value because they will have more IR light from dust and less UV light because dust is absorbing it. Beta is the slope of the UV um, light. So the wavelength, the UV wavelengths, the slope of that light is going to be our beta. So if you have a positive beta value, that means that the dust is absorbing more of the UV light, um, the more of the short wavelength, high energy UV light. Um, and we see this kind of positive value. If you don't have much dust, then you might get a negative beta value um, as we're seeing instead the starlight. So IRX beta tells us a bit about the amount of dust. There are complicating factors in that it also depends on what types of um, stars you have, but because we do expect even older populations of stars to emit some UV light, even though they'll emit a lot less, we can still look at this kind of um, beta, IRX beta relationship um, and try to estimate the amount of dust in a galaxy. Um, this was just a graph showing, again, a sort of kind of a research question that maybe you could look into using IRX and beta. So um, for galaxies, when they compared starbursting galaxies to local universe galaxies, what they saw was that the starburst galaxies had higher IRX values for a given beta. So their UV slopes, if you look at just the same UV slope, the starbursting galaxies seem to have more IR emission for the same UV slope, which means there's more hot dust, probably. So that IR hump is bigger. So um, kind of just thinking about the types of questions you could answer with this data once you know IRX and beta, um, which SEB fitters will give you and then use to estimate the um, amount of dust attenuation. SED fitters will also tell you about the types of dust um, and just kind of what's happening within those. This is a paper um, from my advisor. Uh, so he does a lot looking at dust fitting, SED fitting, um, and specifically he's really interested in how um, to best fit this kind of uh, the IR emission from the warm grains, how to get the right temperatures of those warm grains. And you're going to need to add up multiple, uh, and he adds multiple um, black body curves to try to get a, the right fit here. Um, the other thing that, so you'll get kind of a temperature, a temperature distribution of your large grains based on um, what black body models you need to fit in order to produce the infrared curve. Um, and then you'll also get an idea of the ratio of PAH molecules to larger molecules. Um, so that's shown on these graphs by this QPAH factor, um, which is the mass ratio of PAHs to larger grains. So based on your fit, you can get an idea of how much of the dust um, is large grains and how much of the dust is those small PAH molecules. And you can also get some ideas about the temperature ranges of dust in your galaxy. Um, and just how much, and then again, um, more ideas about how much uh, light is being absorbed by that dust, which can you can use to try to predict um, how much light is actually in the galaxy. So I think, yeah, that was kind of my last slide. So. Um, that's a bit about, so now I'm going to finish walking through Seagal with y'all. Um, but before I do that, does anyone have questions about any of the things that we're learning from SED models and how they're used? Just as a quick overview again, um, we're fitting a simple stellar population as well as that dust attenuation curve um, that we saw last class in order to find um, the amount of unattenuated starlight, which can tell us stuff about the stellar mass, 
the mass to light ratio, um, as well as the star formation history of a galaxy. And it can tell us about the dust. It can tell us the size distribution of the dust as well as the temperature of the dust. So those are some of the kind of big overall things we're getting from SED fitting, giving us a really powerful way to kind of answer some questions about galaxy history and makeup um, without actually having to do a lot of detailed spectroscopy, just getting moving from photometry, using that to try to mimic doing um, detailed spectroscopy. So that's the point of SED fitting um, and how um, it can be used to just pull out a ton of information about a galaxy. Okay. Um, so now, just a note, um, next time you guys run Seagal, you don't have to go through all these steps. This should all be ready for you. You can just start here. And then um, again, you won't also have to install it every time um, or create your environment every time. This was just, this is the only time you have to do that. So once you are here, um, you now need to change directions so you're in your Seagal directory. So just a reminder, I am already there. One way you can check is that you can type PWD into your terminal and that'll tell you what directory you are in. Um, you can see what directories you can move to by typing LS. Um, so right now I could move, if I wanted to, I could go into out. That's one of the directories I have that I could move to by typing cd, change directory, and then out. Um, I don't really want to be there right now, though, so I'm going to go back. You can go back by typing cd and then two dots. So if you download it, so you um, everyone is going to have Seagal in a slightly different place on their computer, so I can't necessarily tell you where to go. Um, if you just downloaded it, it might still be in your downloads. Um, so. I'm going to, another trick you can do to get back to your base, you can do it tilde. So cd tilde brings you back to your base directory, which for me is just Sutter.js. Um, so if I wanted to go to my um, downloads, I would do cd, if I could type it right, downloads. And then um, if that's where Seagal was, I could get to Seagal from there. It is not because I moved mine to um, desktop. You can also do multiple at once, which is what I'm doing here. I'm jumping to desktop and then Seagal, which is in desktop. So this is just a, a little bit, you're seeing me use work in a terminal, but this is kind of a lot of coding stuff is done in terminals. So I'm just trying to show that as well. Um, and this Seagal stuff will need to be done in a terminal. So once you are in your Seagal directory, the next thing we're going to do, we're going to see if this works. You don't want to change the seat piece of all. I need to change that too. Sorry, that was incorrect. Um, it's from an older version of Seagal. Um, so from here, we want to run the code Python, setup pi, and then space build. Let's see if this lets me do it. I've already done this, so it might get angry at me. We're going to see. Got this error this morning too. Um, I'm gonna really quickly change the one that I know works. Um, sorry. Um, this is why I said this is frustrating. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to really quickly go to my one that I know is working, or at least I'm pretty sure is working. Okay. So here is where you'd want to do Python set up high build. It was working this morning. Now it's not. Okay, cool. That's fun. Um,
So the question is, why did it work this morning? I was very worried this was going to happen, and now it is happening. Um, so <laughs> this is why I get frustrated with Seagal. This is frustrating. I'm sorry. Um, well, this might be if this is if you are getting through this without an error, that's great. I'm going to show you what to do. It's not going to work for me. I don't know why it's not working. I'm going to keep trying to figure it out. Um, but this is why I want you to tell me where you're running into errors so we can actually figure this out. So the next thing, if that had worked, would be you would do Python setup pi develop, which is also going to have the same error. I'm assuming. Yep. Um, and then from there, you should have Seagal running if you didn't have that error. Um, to run Seagal, this is going to give me an error as well. But what you would then do is do psegal any. Assuming it's going to give me an error. It might not. Who knows? Um, that would be crazy. Oh, sorry, piece of gall. In it. In. Okay, so it did work. That's interesting. Um, so um, this generates a file called piece of gall any. So I think that's why I. So yes, I put it right there. Um, so if I go to my Seagal directory. Oops, sorry. Um, let me, there we go. Um, we'll see that there's a file here called psegal any, which is where we tell Seagal how we want it to run. So mine is going to be longer because I was running this this morning. Um, but the things that you need to update first are you need to give it a mag file. So a mag file is going to be the file that has all of your data in it. So um, for today, I gave you one called ngc0337. Um, and it's going to be .mag. And what these look like um, is it's going to look kind of like it's a text file that has um, the name of your galaxy, the redshift, the distance, and then all of the data for that galaxy. So FUV through, um, this is 250 microns. Um, you're gonna, I've put um, in our course files, I've made a directory that has all of the mag files for the galaxies. You guys just have to put in your UGRIS magnitude, your UGRIS fluxes in Milijanskis. Um, so you just pick yours, um, download it, and then edit it slightly. So um, you can do that here, or if you have a text editor, um, you can do it there. Um, and it'll just there'll be some not blank spaces, but places where I put in uflux, uflux error, and you'll have to input those yourself. So in the piece of any file, I again here I show you what you need to change. The first thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to tell it um, what mag foil you want to use. I think I gave you the slightly wrong name. It should be ngc. 
0337 sigal.mag. Um, we don't need a parameters file. We're not going to use that. Um, but we do need to fill in a bunch of these SED modules. I think I also um, still need to correct this as well. Um, so for some reason, you can't copy underscores. So you have to actually type those in. I also left out radio and AGN. So after DL 2014, you need Fritz 2006, as well as radio. Um, and this just tells Seagal um, which uh, models we want to fit our data to. So it's going to use a delayed star formation model, uh, Brulot and star Charlot, um, simple stellar population. Um, it's going to use a nebular gas emission line model. It's going to use a dust attenuation model based on a modified starburst from um, the Calzetti 2000 paper attenuation law. Um, it's going to use um, a model of the dust from the drain paper, which has a model of what dust looks like, um, a model of what it would look like if it was an AGN, a model of the radio light, and then um, a few things about the rest frame parameters, and those things aren't super important. Um, we also need to tell it to use a PDF analysis um, method for fitting this data. Um, not super important. And we need to tell it how many cores to use. Um, however many cores your computer says you can use mine has four. If yours has eight, you can use eight. Um, once we've done that, we can save this file um, either by doing Control S or by going and saving it. And then back um, in our terminal, we are ready to do the next bit of code, which is going to be psigal gencom. So generate configuration, psigal gencom. We'll see if that gives me an error or not. No question. Cool. So if things work, you should see this text. The configure file has been updated. Um, and please complete the various model parameters to fix this. So um, our psigal any file should now have more data, which mine was already there because I made it this morning. Um, so reload it. And we should see now that it knows all the bands of light that we're going to use um, since we've entered them. And there's also some spaces where you can tell it what to assume for different properties, which we're not going to mess with for now. We're just going to leave that for now um, and let it do all of its stuff. Um, the one last thing that we do need to change um, uh, is the save best SED. We want to change that to true because that's going to let us um, plot the model once we're done with it. So we're going to save that. And now we should be all ready to run Seagal. Um, so what we can do from here, is we can check that things look okay to Seagal by running psigal check. Um, and so if that's not a giant number, that's a good thing. I'm a little concerned that it's one because it should be, oh no, no, because there's only one galaxy. Sorry, I did it this morning with a different file. Um, so if that's like a number that's not huge and terrible. That's a good thing. Um, we want a pretty small number. Um, but if you've done, I've done it from like 10 to about 1000. So somewhere in there, just if it's fills up the text, it's going to crash your computer. So that would be bad. Um, so once we get that and things look good, you can do P Seagal run. And that should run Seagal. Um, yeah, I'm getting an error because things are not working, but that is what should run Seagal. Um, once it does run and you don't have an error, you can do psigal minus plots SED to plot an SED of your galaxy. It's going to get probably angry at me because it didn't actually run Seagal. Um, 
but since I did do this earlier, somehow, I don't know why it worked earlier and it didn't this time, just typical. Um, no, sorry, I can go to one of my older out files. So it, when PSIGAL runs, it creates a folder called out um, and it just bumped the one I made this morning um, to a different time. So I plotted some SEDs and I can look at those here and those show me um, the SED fit for the data um, with kind of funky parameters. So chi-squared tells you how good the fit is. You want that to be close to one. It is not, this is not a very good fit, which we can kind of see this data up here is all over the place. Um, it also gives you um, some text files that tell you um, the different properties of the galaxy. So they're a little ugly, um, but you can see we're getting a stellar metallicity, a time of the starburst, um, an age of the main sequence stars, a fraction of the stars that formed in the latest burst. Um, so all these kind of different values for this galaxy, um, the stellar, um, the stellar mass of old stars, the total stellar mass, um, this math, the luminosity of the old stars. Um, so just all kinds of star formation rate, star formation rate for the past 100 mi million years, just all kinds of different data is coming out um, in this file. Um, a little hard to read, but we can use code to read it, use pandas to read it as well as another option. So besides the fact I had errors um, with uh, that extension tools, um, that's how you run Seagal. Um, so your assignment for today is to try to do that as much as you can. Um, so in SED2, try to do as much of that as you can and then tell me where you get stuck. Um, and then also I would like for you, um, in 15 minutes, um, if you did already get stuck um, or if you haven't quite gotten sick already yet, um, in the 15 minutes before class ends, I'd like for you to write me a bit of a reflection on how the semester is going so far and if there are any changes you think you might wanna make to how you're working and studying for the second half of the semester um, and if there's anything I could do to help you as you make those changes. So that's, your main goal for today um, to see how far you can get in Seagal and let me know where you run into errors and then tell me a little bit about how things are going as we reach this kind of mid-semester point. So that is all I wanted to do for today. Um, if no one else has, if anyone has any questions, I'll answer them now or, or we can kind of end class early and I'll let you guys do this yourself. That sounds good. So I'm not hearing any questions. So I think, um, yeah, in the 15 minutes before 3.50, um, it'd be a great time to do this SED part two um, to get participation points for today. But I don't think you necessarily need to stay on Zoom to do